All right, so we're going to do an outdoor terrain tutorial. What I've got here is a selection of ruins and other props that I have from the Epic Isometric Project. This is, everybody knows, kind of my favorite way of really quickly throwing together some isometric terrain for my D&D game. So I have a background layer that is just the blank map. It's just grass. And then I have foreground props that all kind of come from various ruins packs. I've got some trees, I've got other things, and I'm gonna arrange them into a battle mat. Now, the first thing I have to think about is whether or not my map is gonna be readable by my players. By that, I mean they're gonna be able to look at it, they're gonna be able to diver differentiate the foreground from the background, and they're gonna be able to make strategic decisions that make the game fun. So they're gonna hide behind cover, they're going to use height to their advantage, uh, they're going to try and avoid being surrounded, and maybe they're going to use some of the terrain uh, to force choke points so they can use their area of effect spells and maybe get uh, you know, fireballs and do lots of damage and stuff that's fun in Dungeons & Dragons. So I'm going to play this video, which is a recording of me uh, building the map uh, in Fast Forward so you don't have to kind of watch me in Photoshop for 30 minutes or whatever it took to do this originally. So first thing I'm doing is I am going and I am... Uh, changing the color of the background to green. I'm just doing this with a hue shift, uh, you know, kind of adjusting the colors. Now I'm bringing in some uh, example, these aren't actually my characters, but I'm bringing in uh, character tokens. And this helps me get a sense of scale as I'm building. So I'll just group them in a different area. And then I can resize things appropriately. So here I'm having the bases all be an inch by an inch. And I can resize the tree so that it looks right. I'm gonna target an inch grid effectively, uh, similar to what Roll20 does. So I'm making sure I'm working in a Photoshop layer that is 70 dots per inch, or basically 70 pixels per inch. I'm arranging the terrain to kind of map out some, uh, it's almost like uh, playing Warhammer or something where you've got scattered terrain and that causes you know cover and line of sight issues for people fighting. And the players will make decisions about where they set up, where they go, uh, maybe where they uh, hold their ground and where they retreat based upon this and the things you do. I'm going and cloning trees. Trees can, you know, really quickly in an outdoor sort of map out the borders or, or kind of where you're not supposed to go. Uh, trees, in, in this case, you could use them as cover, but an isometric, um, it, it's hard to do the fight behind the trees. So I try not to have too many where the fight's actually going to occur. Uh, and I, I hue shift things so just so it's readable, so that the grass and the tree colors are a little bit different. Now, on new layers, in between uh, various layers, I'm going and shading in with a soft brush. I'm going and making some shadows. And I'm actually going and painting over some of the props in a different layer as well, so that the foreground things can kind of cast shadows onto the background props. There's a little area here that when I played this with my party, uh, I found that they had a hard time reading a kind of a wall behind uh, you know that floor there. They couldn't tell if it was a, a wall in front of a floor or a wall uh, and then a ceiling of a building or something. They had a hard time reading it. So I'm going and outlining. I'm trying different things, trying to see if I can make that be more readable. Eventually, I just decided to get rid of the ground because it was going to make the fight harder for people to read. So I just got rid of the ground there and let the grass kind of see through it. I adjust the map and, and I know that it's 55 inches by 32 inches. I create some extra trees on the outside just in case the fight spills over to that side of the building uh, just to kind of indicate, hey, that's the edge of the map. You can't really go farther than that. And, and, and there you go. There's the map. And now I'm going to export it as a JPEG, compress it down because I, I don't need all the, the fine detail or anything. The compression's fine and for a Roll20 game. And I'm going to bring it into Roll20, and I'm going to line it up. I'm going to copy and paste over some of the character minis just to kind of get a sense of scale, see how it's working. I'm going to grab some monsters just to like lay it out and show, okay, maybe they're going to attack from, from that side of the map. And I'm going to tint them because I need them to show up really clearly against that green background. So I'm going to make them red, uh, you know, pick a right color of red for, you know, these red kobolds or something. Uh, and, and I'm going to throw in some extra large minis there just to kind of show uh, some of the big birds up there. Uh, I, I messed around for a little bit here with uh, area of effect templates just to see you know what areas would be dangerous because they kind of force some natural clumping. And, and I, what I found out was that 
Um, it, in these outdoor maps, when you don't have the, the kind of the tiles of a dungeon floor, it can be difficult to do uh, in Roll20 tactical movement. And players do like tactical movement uh, in, in Roll20. So I decided to actually go back to Photoshop and paint in a grid. And here I am kind of drawing the grid and then cloning it and making it cover the whole map and, and aligning it to the isometric in, in the Roll20. Uh, in, pardon me, from the uh, isometric uh, art assets that I had. Um, and then I'm shifting it and I'm desaturating it and I'm uh, you know making it, when it's against the grass, I'm making it dark. And when it's uh, against the foreground layers, I'm making it light so, so it stands out really well. And I'm making it 50% uh, uh, opacity, right? So I'm making it transparent so you can see the stuff behind it. Uh, I think it helps it read better. So I'm, I'm going and deleting the white grid from areas where you can't uh, really walk like the sides of these pillars. And then when I'm done with that, I think this looks pretty good. I am kind of moving around in Photoshop, the minis to see if it's readable. I'm going and replacing the old map with the new map on the map layer in Roll20. And from there I'm done. So now I can, uh, maybe I can switch over to Roll20 and I can show you what I'm doing. So I've got my minis. And it's pretty easy for the characters to make sure that they're aligned to the grid because I added that grid there. The players zoom in here. The, the map is big enough because I, I stuck with that 70 DPI. So if I look at the information on here, uh, I, I actually had the, the width be 55 and the height be 32, which matches sort of the inches of the, uh, the Photoshop work that I was doing at 70 DPI right here. So these dimensions are exactly the same as the map, which makes it easy to place. Um, you know, in isometric, of course, the distances aren't going to be correct. So, you know, five feet, 10 feet, no, that, that's not actually correct. So maybe, you know, when I go, uh, you know, that, that whole distance there, the, this measuring thing isn't going to be great. You can mess with that, but I usually just tell my players to ignore it. So if 70 pixels is five feet, you know, maybe it needs to be 10 feet or something in order for this to work. It's hard to kind of keep track of that. Nope, got to go in the other direction. So I got to go make this three point. 0.5 feet. So now, you know, crossing one of these long diagonals there versus there, you know, that's going to be about it right. But, you know, now this distance to this distance. Uh, isometric says that, you know, that distance and that distance and that distance should be the same. And they're all five feet, but the diagonals now, there's more diagonals that you have to think about that aren't going to be the same distance in the projection. So that, that's not going to work. But, you know, the rest of it works pretty great. Uh, so I can you know, clearly see that I'm hiding behind a wall here. So a monster on that side and, and that side shouldn't be able to see each other. The kobolds, they look pretty great. And if I put status effects on things, uh, so let's, you know, maybe uh, put a status effect on one of these kobolds. Let's say the kobold is charmed, right? Uh, you know, that one nice thing to test is whether or not uh, I've got enough pixels there so that the little uh, status effect icons are readable, aren't interfering with the names, and you know sometimes on some of the pre-made maps that come with the modules, uh, there's just not enough pixels, and uh, as a result, the status effects can look huge. Over here, uh, I've got these Eblis, and uh, they're pretty cool, um, and they're huge. Right? Pardon me, they're large creatures, right? They're they're two squares by two squares, so they're actually quite tall compared to the characters, because I'm purposely putting the characters, you know, not having their minis fill up the grid, right, the, the way they might if I was playing, you know, with actual minis. I'm having them be quite a bit smaller, just so that it's easy to select each other, um, you know, so the, the players are a little smaller than they should be, but it should all work. Uh, and you've got this little transition between, you know, being on the stairs and whatnot. Some of this isn't exceptionally readable. Um, but I, I like it better than having these dark grid lines over, you know, some of the nice pretty art that I had. Uh, you know, the monsters are big, they're scary, uh, it works pretty well. All right, so uh, the last thing is that what happens if these Eblis have a fly speed? So what happens if they, you know, instead of just walking off the edge here, what happens if they, uh, you know, actually fly above the battle? What, what, how do I represent that? Well, this is tricky. There's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one way is to uh, actually use a, um, you know, flying marker. So I can, you know, maybe say yellow is flying, and then I can hit the one key, and maybe I move this guy up. So now I know that he's flying above. But that's hard to read. So if he flies another five feet up, I can go and use this marker and say, marker it again. Now he's, he's two squares up. Great. 
that that's okay, but I mean that works better in top down than it does in isometric. But so instead, I'm going to use a trick that I learned uh, playing D and D with physical minis, which is they've got these nice plastic, you know, flying stands that are marked out in five, ten increments that are really nice. Um, so instead, I'm going to go and I'm going to grab one of these flying stands and I'm going to size it so that here we go. I want to size it so that the each five foot marker I have here is right on the money exactly five feet. So this guy is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 feet tall. So that from here I can put it in the center of the marker and say this guy's flying and maybe if I bring this to the to the front uh, I can say that this character because he's standing on this stand is 25 feet up or I could say that he's here 20 feet up, 15 feet up 30 feet up. And because this is still line art, it's not a picture, it's actually drawn using the one of these polygon or freehand line tools, I can make a different color. So maybe this ranger is green. So I can just change his stand color to green. Whereas if the Eblis, you know, so if, uh, you know, maybe he's, he's, uh, you know, got a fly spell on him or something, right? So I can say he's, he's actually standing above this square. And he's right there. I get rid of that token marker there. Uh, but if the Eblis starts flying too, I can just clone out a flying stand for him. Let's see how tall is this. Uh, looks like this uh, stairway here is 5, 10, 15, 20 feet tall. So say the Eblis steps off, and he's going to, uh, the Eblis is going to step off here, and it's going to be 25 feet up. Uh, and I'm going to make sure the Eblis is in the foreground in front of uh, that. I can say the Eblis is 25 feet up or so and is occupying that square. So that, you know, I don't, you know, if he's standing over here and flying and uh, standing on top of, uh, you know, hovering over this square here, I don't get confused and think that he's somewhere else, right? So this Eblis, uh, maybe I'll make the Eblis blue, right? This Eblis uh, is flying above here. Uh, and, you know, Shylon is standing way below him and can't actually attack him. If he's over here, he can't attack him either. But if he's this ranger and wants to close into melee, maybe he can by, you know, just, just uh, moving the mini up here. And that's going to make it uh, possible to kind of play in height as uh, in isometric when you're flying. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test that out. I haven't, I haven't actually used these in a fight yet. I'm going to test that out and see how it goes. You'll probably get a video replay of me for the a scene that's coming up in my Tomb of Annihilation game, which might have some flying. All right. Thanks, everybody.